Our work is often very much about the bridge between what we call the digital and the analog. Uh, the analog being very traditional craft processes, techniques, material, and the digital being what we have available to us now in the contemporary age. The project that we did called Hybridea is a very good example of this. It starts off with perhaps the ultimate and analog of making, putting your hands in mud, making things from clay, which would have been the earliest form of humans making anything at all, uh, and then taking that process on a journey. Uh, we made hundreds and hundreds of small clay pots very quickly, ripping out the clay from, from a bigger block. Uh, so you have tear marks and folds coming naturally through the clay, and also our fingerprints in it very quickly and making very quick pots, essentially. Then these pieces were 3D scanned using the most high-tech, uh, really high-definition 3D scanning, the best that we were able to get at this moment in time. So you're really going straight from the most analog to the most digital. The pieces were then enlarged, altered slightly in the computer using 3D software. Then we went back to digital again by printing them out or CNCing them out using a robot from a large block of foam to the size that we wanted. Uh, and then it has this story between the digital and analog all the way through its process. And that relationship between the digital and the analog is something that is always fascinating and I think we're investigating again and again. When we had the hybrid day of bronze pieces made and here together in the studio, we knew we had to, to show them. And we thought about having an event in our space to show them and having music. And when you saw the, the finished uh, series of these bronze bronzes, that it, it felt that it needed to sit on a classical platform. The first thing that sprung to mind was Bach's cello suite. But that maybe would be too much of an easy thing to do to sort of just rig up your, your hi-fi. That, that, that's kind of how it started. It's like we had that, we knew that the, the, the cello suite was right, but we just needed, it needed to be more, it needed to feel more in place with uh, contemporary life. So that's when we um, called up Rosie. We've known Rosie for many years, um, and we love the way that she uses music uh, in a digital and analog way as we do with our work, being a classically trained pianist but also working very much with electronic music. So we rang firstly to ask advice but also really to kind of fish to see if she'd be interested in doing a collaboration with us on this. Well, I really love Bach. So I was really excited when they said that they wanted to use this. And what was so amazing is straight away she, we mentioned Bach's cello suites and Rosie said I have a really good friend his name is Gerald Peregrine and he's a wonderful cellist but he lives in Ireland so I suggested to the boys that we fly him over and we hadn't thought about using the digital analog in such a physical way the thing about the cello is that it has this really powerful and emotional sound. What Rosie suggested, which took it further, was not that he would just play Bach's cello suites, but that firstly, he would improvise on it, so he would be taking it further in a classical way, but that also she would play with him together uh, with electronic music, so it would actually become a duet between a classical cello and electronic music, both improvising. So this became the first building block to our process, the first analogue element. We just thought that was perfect. We didn't give Rosie a, a brief. But what was so strong with this is that it worked. It wasn't just a collaboration because we like Rosie's music and composition. What she does would add something to what we do, would develop the story of the objects within a place and time. She creates a body of work of her own in response to our work. My work was to create a kind of palette of colour and um, texture, sounds that I thought would work with the cello, and then synthesise them into different tracks. So we're already in with the cello. And then I created this kind of shimmery sound. The 
the next sound I created was this fast arpeggiator. It just gives it that the texture weaving through. And then I wanted to bring in some richness into it, so I created an orchestral pass. I love writing for choir, so I had to include female choir and a male choir. Not to forget solo voice. And then something which I could just be a bit anarchistic about, so I don't really know like what I was going to use it for. I just called it, I called this one crazy shit. From the very beginning, we had whatever there was like six kilos of terracotta clay, where we're tearing out uh, little snippets improvising exactly you don't call that improvisation that's what it is kind of instinctive we didn't it wasn't discussed but it, it is exactly that that form of making is improvisation um because we don't plan every piece but we know that we have an idea in our minds and in the, that, that comes through into our, our into our hands into our way of working and shows itself in the work so it's natural of course that the music should equally not be rigidly planned but be an improvisation alongside that by 7 p.m. we were still setting up the set and uh, we'd had time to do a sound check but we knew that there was going to be no time to do a, a whole run through. cabling, there was uh, visuals, there was uh, all the synthesizers needed to get out. I mean, Gerald, in many ways, was the only thing that... The only one who was organized. <laughs> did it have to be rigged <laughs> up in any sort of way. I said to Gerald, it's going to be you, center stage, you're going to start the performance with solo unaccompanied bark, and then I will slowly creep in until it crescendos to a point where I'm going to completely drown you out at times. and just keep going. And then other times I'm going to pull back and you will be completely exposed. And at those times to play the bark. At the event, people started coming in probably about seven o'clock. I think the performance was set for eight o'clock. Um, we were very worried about the timing of people arriving, getting them into the right place at the time, at the right time, them being quiet. You know, these are the Because the Vernissage was a standing situation. It normally that kind of encourages uh, chatter uh, at, at these kinds of events, particularly when there's people from the fashion, design, um, art world in the audience. But what we did first of all is everyone went into the main gallery space that we have there, which is very white walls, concrete floor, to see. And most of the pieces were in there in a classic way that people would expect to see at a, at a private view event. Um, and then when everyone out here was ready, um, what we did was to get everyone's attention with a bit of history about it, a bit of a, a story about why the collaboration had taken place, the history of the space itself. And then we brought them out to this area of the tunnel to watch the performance here. So physically, where I was going to be was to one side and like what everyone could see was just Jerry and then the projection of the Fredrickson Stallard's film. We didn't know exactly um, how Rosie and Gerald were going to progress this, but it started with Gerald just playing Bach's cello suite number one, the opening lines, just exactly as it was. And then it gradually started to close to the bike, and then Rosie gently came to the electronic.
Jerry started playing and what really surprised me was that the entire room were completely silent. Oh. People just went quiet and it was just perfect because it was so unexpected. And because it really caught people's attention, they were silent for the entire 25 minutes. I didn't see anybody get their phone out and film it, um, which is great. I, I, I hate the fact that, that people film things rather than experiencing them. Um, although it was a little bit unfortunate in that we don't have very much footage of it. It's interesting because during all, all this, the whole performance, uh, Rosie was tucked away in the corner down the fire escape and Patrick and I were positioned very much to one side as well, just allowing it to happen. Although we'd orchestrated it, the three of us, between us, it wasn't about us physically, it was about what we had created and about the audience and letting them experience it. And so I guess it was naturally instinctive of us to move aside while it happened. Um, to let everyone just be a part of it. Really. But the thing about working with professionals like Fredericks and Stallard and, and working with people that you, you have great admiration and respect for and, and knowing that they're just really good at what they do, I just knew that it was all going to come together in the end. It went so quickly. It was, I, I, and we were both really, I'm saying both me, me Ian and Rosie and Gerald, uh, so excited afterwards because there was this real feeling of... Um, achievement.